Well, I'm very excited today to begin this series of messages called The Quest. The Quest. So if you're new today, you come at the right time. It's a great day to begin uh, coming to Linwood and, and, and not just to learn about our church and, and to experience our church. And Steve, thank you. Great word of what Christ has done in your life. And what a great testimony about just the love that he experienced here at Linwood. But we know that that's because of the love of Jesus Christ in us and through us. And there are several reasons why I, I want us to begin this series of messages on the quest. Why the quest? Well, first of all, to discover Jesus Christ. There may be some here today who are unbelievers. Those like Steve who, who've come and, and uh, he came with an attitude where he was a staunch atheist. But I, I want you to notice what he said. Why was he an atheist? Steve was not an atheist for intellectual reasons. As most atheists are not atheists because of intellectual reasons. They're atheists because of emotional pain that they've experienced. And so the God that they had created in their minds and put in a box, that God had failed them in some way from their perspective. So he came with hurt and pain and, and a distorted view of God. And without understanding truth, we can understand why he would come from that perspective. And so our goal is to help the unbeliever discover the real Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. Also, for the believer to rediscover Jesus Christ. Uh, for some of us, we're floating along in our journey of faith and we come to church, and we do good things in life. We help people. But we've lost our first love. There's just not the passion for Christ and, and, and that relationship with Christ that we once had. And I pray that God will use this series of messages for the believer to rediscover Jesus Christ and experience a true spiritual awakening in their lives. Also, it's getting back to the foundation of Christianity, Jesus Christ being the cornerstone of our faith. And what I mean really is it's beyond what we think about uh, our own personal faith. It, it's Christianity as a whole. What is the Christian faith? And the Christian faith is a person, Jesus Christ. In that, we need to clear our heads of all the religious noise, which I'll speak to in just a moment. There's a massive amount of noise by the, quote, Christian community that has only confused our understanding of what Christianity really is about. Why the quest? Because man needs a truth compass. He needs an intellectual compass. In other words, is there absolute truth or is truth relative? If that's truth for you, that's great. I have my own truth. Well, is that right? It's not just perspective, but is that right to say that I can have truth and you can have a different truth? That sounds like an oxymoron to me. It seems that there is truth. There has to be absolute truth. And we're going to discover absolute truth as we study the life of Jesus Christ. But man also needs a moral compass. He needs a behavioral compass. In other words, is there a moral standard by which all men are to live? Again, hey, if you feel like doing that, that's great. Who am I to judge you? And if I feel like doing what I want to do, who are you to judge me? We're going to discover that there is moral truth. There's a moral compass that God has designed for all men to live by. Why the quest? To understand God, to get that right perspective about God, but also to get the right perspective about me. And when we study Jesus Christ, he's going to undo you. And he's going to flay you open. And you're going to realize who you really are 
when you are encountering the risen Christ. But it's going to be good when he does that. Because you're going to see him for who he is. A God of grace, a God of love, and a God of mercy. How do I explain my past and my present and my future as I think about me? Where I came from, why am I here, and where am I going? Well, the world's going to say, here's where you came from, and here's why you're here. It's a bad answer, what they say. And here's where you're going. It's even worse. You're going nowhere. But when we discover Jesus Christ, when we begin this quest, we're going to answer all those questions of our, of our existence, past, present, and future. Believers need a clear, concise, and compelling response to the culture. We struggle with this. And I'm going to tell you why we struggle with this. We don't know Jesus Christ. We don't know the Jesus of Scripture. If we know who Jesus is, we're going to be able to engage the culture. And we're going to be able to have a response to their questions. A response that is clear, that is concise, and that is compelling to them. There was a boy who was putting a puzzle together. On one side of the puzzle was a picture of the world, and on the other side was a picture of Jesus Christ. So he was trying to put the puzzle together as he was looking at the world, and he was having a hard time, and his mom said, Johnny, just turn the puzzle over, turn the pieces over, and and put it together looking at Jesus. And he quickly put the puzzle together. You see, if you get Jesus right, you get the world right. If you get Jesus right, you're able to respond to the world in which we live in. We have a biblical worldview, a Jesus worldview. We see ourselves, we see them, and we're able to help them understand themselves as they discover Jesus Christ. Why do we need the quest? Because the need for a spiritually healthy, robust, courageous, relevant church That means a Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, and God-glorifying church. Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, and a God-glorifying church. That's why we need the quest. Why do we need the quest? Let Let me try to help with that same theme. In light of Easter this past Sunday, I want you to think about why the quest? If you think about what you saw, maybe what you read leading up to Easter, even Easter weekend, you're going to understand why we need the quest. My dad wrote an article last week in, in light of this past uh, week before Easter. And this is what he said. He wrote a brief article. Easter is always interesting both for believers and non-believers. Every succeeding year causes growing Christians to appreciate more deeply the consequences of the event, and every succeeding year produces anti-resurrection chatter, much of it in the churches themselves. One expects Jesus' resurrection to offend outsiders, and especially the secular press, which must annually attempt to re-debunk it. For them, a historically demonstrable resurrection simply cannot be allowed. That violates the faith presuppositions of all so-called naturalists and their passionate religion of eminence. That is, what you see is what you get, and it's all you get. All the tired rhetoric, Jesus swooned and revived, his body was stolen, the apostles were liars or psychos, etc., reappears annually. With now and then new gospels discovered, even one from Judas, finally getting history right. Who is to be believed, Simon Peter who had a pontiff's mitre riding on the deal, or poor abused Judas who was driven not by guilt but by mistreatment to suicide? Spurgeon explained the phenomenon, quote, the son, he said, cannot discover herself to a blind man, unquote, nor to a man who holds both eyes, both hands over his eyes. Few can be surprised at such a come to pass. 
But it is troubling to many churchgoers to learn that their own pastors and writing theologians take the same position as critics. Sometimes equivocating, sometimes not, pastors confess offense at Jesus actually rising from the dead. Flannery O'Connor pinpoints their problem. Jesus, quote, was the only one who ever raised the dead, the misfit continued, and he shouldn't have done it. He thrown everything off balance. Theological misfits, ancient and modern, don't like Jesus acting up and showing up and throwing things off balance by walking out of an actual grave. I once asked a question of two seminary trained pastors, true misfits, of churches in my city several weeks before Easter in a Q&A with other pastors. Did Jesus actually rise from the dead? The first immediately said, no, he didn't. The second trumped him. Well, he did, then added astonishingly, but it didn't make any difference. The odds are that the majority of senior pastors, both Catholic and Protestants, Baptists aren't technically Protestant, but count them in as well, in your town would not be bothered by either answer. It turns out that many things about Jesus offends, indeed scandalizes these people. His birth, his sinless life, his teaching, his miracles, his substitutionary and atoning death, his resurrection, and his second coming to earth. A British theologian courageously answered the second coming question this way during my seminary days. Quote, I am willing to admit that there is a certain not yetness about the kingdom, unquote. A local pastor of a large mainline denomination church says openly that he doesn't believe in an actual hell and he doesn't know a single pastor in his denomination who does. Here's the question. Honestly, in what sense can such men call themselves in any meaningful sense of the words Christian ministers? That is not to berate them. They may choose if they wish to believe an advocate for the church of penguinism. Yes, there is one. That is their right. But in what specific sense can it be said that they are involved in Christian ministry? How is the label itself not a demonstrable fraud? And in the face of their profound shame of historic orthodoxy, why not at least be honest? Why not stand up, say as much, and abandon the farce? Quote, am I sorry? I cannot possibly believe this claptrap any longer. And I here and now resign to pursue an honorable living elsewhere. What one asks about Jesus' own offense? One could cite 50 relevant sentences from him, all the while assuming he actually lived and we have a trustworthy witness to him in the New Testament. But one will more than suffice. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. It's perfectly said why we need the quest. We have lost our understanding of Jesus Christ. We have lost our bearings. We have lost our compass, our spiritual compass, as to why we're here as believers, why we're here as the church, and what do we really believe about Jesus Christ So I ask you to join me on this quest. It's going to be a tremendous quest. And I want to kind of give you an overview of where we're going. Where will the quest take us? We have these icons here that uh, you'll be able to follow along with me. First of all, we're going to be breaking camp. And these are sub-series that I'm going to be doing along the quest. Breaking camp is, is really preparing to leave. There are some things that we need to know before we embark on the quest and uh, so we'll we'll spend some time this morning on that secondly we'll we'll have a few weeks actually on breaking camp next we're going on the ascent that's the sermon on the mount we're going to spend a few weeks there and we're going to hear Christ explain what radical discipleship is all about what it really means to be a follower of Christ and what the kingdom of God is about So we're going to climb the mountain. We're going to go on the ascent for a few weeks. Then we're going to have campfire lessons. We're just going to slow down for a while, sit around the camp, and we're going to to read and, and learn from the parables of Jesus Christ. So we'll spend several weeks there with the parables. Then 
Which path? We're going to come to a fork in the road as we're on this quest and we're going to understand Jesus' teaching about salvation, about the new birth, about how we are able to enter into the kingdom of God. And then we have the home stretch. That's Passion Week. That's the last week of Jesus Christ. And then we have commissioned our final instructions as we're sent out and continuing the quest. So today we're going to begin breaking camp. And when we do that, imagine yourself at a base camp, and, and we've made our, our way there, and now we're getting ready to, to go on this quest, on this journey, on this adventure. And there's some things that we need to know before we go, and we'll take a few weeks. But today, I want us to begin by looking at the birth of Jesus Christ. If you will, open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4, and I'm only going to read two verses, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. And Paul gives a tremendous summary statement of Jesus Christ. And as it relates to this idea of him coming to us, this birth of Christ. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Notice what he says. But when the completion of time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, Born of a virgin, your translation may say. Born under the law. To redeem those under the law. That we might receive adoption as sons. It's a tremendous statement of what he says about the birth of Jesus Christ. And why he came. Now, what do we need to know as we're about to break camp? What do we need to know? Well, first of all, the quest has a map. The quest has a map, and the quest is really an eternal quest from eternity to eternity. Now, I want you to follow along with me very carefully because I want to help you see how, how the quest is not just about Jesus Christ. We're going to look at a segment of the quest, and we're calling really that the quest, but there's a larger quest that man needs to understand. So here, here's, here's the, the context from an eternal perspective of Jesus Christ. First, we have creation. Then Adam and Eve were created as well. And then we have Adam and Eve sinning in the garden. That's considered the fall. Then we have the flood, Noah and the ark. After the flood, we have the Tower of Babel. Man begins to populate. Uh, man is unified. The, uh, humanity is, is unified. Pride begins to set in. And God scatters these people with different languages. And so they, they begin to populate around the earth. But each of these people groups have their own language. That really is a fascinating idea and study in and of itself. And so then you have the period of the patriarchs. Abraham is the first. God calls Abraham and he says, I'm going to make a great nation. We have this covenant that God makes with Abraham. And there's going to be this great nation that is established. You're not going to be able to count them, Abraham. And then we have Isaac. And then we have Jacob, Isaac's son, Jacob. And Jacob wrestles with God. He has a new name. God gives him the name Israel. And Jacob has 12 sons. The 12 tribes of Israel. And so they find their way to, into Egypt. Uh, they were near the land of Canaan. And, and really some, some part of their history is in the land of Canaan. But they go to, to Egypt. Joseph is already there. And they live there. They begin to populate several million people. These are called the Hebrews. God comes. He hears their cry. As they're in bondage in Egypt. And he, he sends them a leader, Moses. And we have the Exodus. From the Exodus, there are 40 years of wilderness. And then it's time for them to cross over into the promised land with Joshua. And so Moses dies. Joshua crosses the Jordan River. And we have the conquest of Canaan. And so they begin to proliferate uh, the promised land. The land of Canaan uh, where we know of today. Then what we have is a period of judges. 
Uh, it's really city-states that are operating uh, at this time, and, and they say, hey, we need a leader. These other nations have a leader. We need a leader. So you have the period of judges. Samuel is the last judge, and then you have the period of the kings, Saul being the first king, David, uh, Solomon, etc., to where it comes to a point where the kingdom divides. You have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Then we find that uh, they, they are taken into exile by the Babylonians and the Assyrians. Around 586, the last group leaves uh, and they go into exile. The temple has been destroyed in Jerusalem. Then you have this uh, remnant that is able to go back. And they go back for the purpose of rebuilding Jerusalem, Nehemiah and Esther. They build the wall. The temple is eventually built. And then you have this intertestamental period. It seems like there are 400 years of silence, but God is at work in a significant way, as I'll point out in just a moment. It is during this period that the second temple is built. Worship is reestablished in the temple. But you also have the development of synagogues. Where you have the emphasis not so much on the high priest as part of it, but you have rabbis, you have these teachers, and so you have these locations of the Jewish worship in, in different places. All right? So things are happening theologically, historically, uh, politically. Jesus Christ comes. Jesus Christ comes. And then we find the establishment of the church, the book of Acts. After we have this church period, we find that Christ comes a second time. Then we have a thousand-year reign, the millennial period of Jesus Christ. After the thousand years, there is the final judgment, a new heaven and a new earth. Now that's a survey of God's history from eternity to eternity. But within this place of historical context, Christ comes. So God has a map that he's giving us on this quest. And we can get the perspective of all these things that are happening in history and what's going to happen. But we look now at the life of Christ. Notice, secondly, the quest has a timeline. Notice what Paul says, but when the completion of time came, when the completion of time came, Paul's describing a period of time that had to elapse before Jesus Christ would come. The Old Testament gives us an understanding of, of, of who Christ, this Messiah, would be and why he's going to come. Notice that, that Isaiah 7, 14 says that he would be born of a virgin called Emmanuel. Isaiah 53, 3 through 7 says that he would be despised, forsaken, pierced, crushed, scourged, oppressed, and afflicted. Micah 5, 2, the Lord promised Bethlehem, one will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from eternity. Means he, he was already existing. He comes to Bethlehem. And he's going to rule over Israel. That's Old Testament prophecy before he ever comes. 2 Samuel 7, 13, Isaiah 9, 7, the Messiah would be born from the lineage of David. 1 Peter 1, verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you, Old Testament prophets, searched and carefully investigated. They inquired into what time or what circumstances the Spirit of Christ, the Messiah, within them was indicating when he testified in advance to the messianic sufferings and the glories that would follow. Now, I've only given you a few of 300 prophecies concerning the coming of Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ. And a lot of things had to happen to, in order for all those prophecies to be fulfilled. But what were some of the other events that took place that made it right, the right time for Christ to come? Well, most of these things happened during the intertestable period, the 400 years of silence. When you read historically what was taking place, you can understand why it was the perfect time for Christ to come. First of all, Alexander the Great, during this intertestable time, he brought the, uh, the Greek language and the Greek culture to, to Palestine. 
uh, and, and to what we'll know as most of the Roman world. It's called the Hellenization of the world. And so Greek was a, a tremendous influence. But, but why was Greek so important? Well, for many reasons. But the Greek language is the most colorful language of languages. You understand exactly what the author is trying to communicate by using the Greek language rather than other more abstract languages, English being one of those. And so we find that we, we, we read our New Testaments. It comes to us from the Greek language. That's why we translate the Greek. And so we have a very colorful language that helps us understand the meaning of words, what God is trying to say to us. Also, Christ came during a time which is known as the Pax Augusta or the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. So when Christ came, it was a peaceful time in, in the Middle East. There had been this period of the Jews uh, being uh, run over by the Assyrians and the Babylon, Babylonians. They were taken into exile. You have all these battles. It's peace when Christ comes. We also find that there were great Roman roads that were built. After Alexander the Great, you have the Maccabeans uh, in, in, in leadership. And because of their, their problems and their family politically, the Romans come. Ptolemy comes and, and he establishes Roman rule. And with that come the Roman roads all over Europe, which makes it very important. Then we have the de development of urban civilization. You have these centers of mass population. So that when the gospel comes into these cities, there are large numbers of people who are able to hear the gospel. It's not a village to a village to a village. They're in metropolitan areas. And we find a great concentration of Jews in these cities where the gospel comes and lives are being changed. We also find that the religions of the world at this period of history is leaving people empty. Even the Jewish religion, with all of its burden, with its laws and regulations and the other pagan religions, people are starving for understanding the meaning of life. Now, a Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, says that the Roman world is to be taxed. And when that happens, Mary and Joseph make their way to the city of David, Bethlehem. Joseph's home, and there the fulfillment of Micah 5, 2. Out of you, Bethlehem, will come one who will rule over Israel, who has come from antiquity. He's always been, and he comes to rule. Now, why is that important? Christ appeared at the most significant time in history so that when he comes, it would have its greatest impact in the work that God was going to do. Sometimes we, in our quest, we question God's timing. We don't get the timeline. Why is this happening now? Why has God waited? Why this period of silence? Good news. God's at work. And when God shows up, when Jesus shows up, God is going to do his greatest work. It's going to have its most lasting impression, its most significant impact, because that's the time that you needed God to show up. So don't lose hope on the quest. And as we learn more about Christ, that's going to make a lot of sense to you that he is at work. Some of you are going through some tough times right now. You, 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 you don't understand God's timing. God understands it. God knows exactly what he's doing. So the quest has a timeline. Your quest has a timeline as well. Very quickly, the quest has a guide. The quest has a guide. Notice what Paul says. God sent his son. God is leading. God is in charge. God is directing. And that means that there's someone we can follow on this quest of discovering Jesus Christ. The coming of Christ was no accident. God had a plan, and he executed his plan at the right time. We also see the preexistence of Christ in these words, the fulfillment of Micah 5, 2. He already existed. 
What, what, what does Paul say? That God sent his son. That means he had to already exist to be sent. You can't send somebody who doesn't exist. So he already existed, and God said, now it's time, son. It's time for you to come and to help them understand who I am and about my kingdom. And then he comes to us. Christ did not begin to be the son of God at Bethlehem. He was before creation. And in that, God understands the circumstances of your quest. He's leading you. He's your guide. And that means you can trust him. You can follow him. Listen, when I go on a a hike and I don't know where I'm going, I don't know where I'm going. I I get real insecure. Man, aren't you thankful for GPSs, for for, uh, Surrey? I mean, you know, man, she's a wonderful lady. And you know that you can just talk to her and she'll talk to you and tell you where things are. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. And, but, you know, there are people going through life, and they have no guide. They have no one leading them. And, man, how great it is to go on a quest somewhere and somebody say, hey, I, 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 I've been here. I, I know what's ahead. Follow me. And so on our quest, we can be assured that our quest has a guide that we can follow. Notice what he says about Jesus Christ. Just a few statements. He's born of a woman. It can be also understood as born of a virgin, but when you think about born of a woman, it just means that Christ came in a very unassuming way. He wasn't born in a palace. He was born in a dingy manger. He was born to a peasant couple. And God's going to come to us in a very unassuming way. Sometimes we want the splendor and the glory and the majesty of him showing up and doing certain things in our lives. So there's going to be a day he's going to show up in all of his glory. But God comes to us in those unassuming ways and he reveals himself to us in those quiet moments of life. When we're all alone with him. So much to say about that, I need to move on. But notice he says he was born under the law. Here he gives some historical context, and he's saying that he was born a Jew. And the reason he was born a Jew is because he had to be a Jew if it was the Messiah from the Old Testament prophecies. And so we find that on this quest that this Christ has come to us and that he is who he claimed to be. So God is in control of the quest. God is leading. God is guiding. You and I can trust him. But notice finally, the quest has a purpose. The quest has a purpose. Verse 5, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now, we've got to understand this. And this will be repeated often in the series. Why did Christ come? What was the purpose of Christ coming? Well, Two reasons he gives us, to redeem those under the law. The word redeem was a word that was used in the slave market uh, uh, time when you would buy a slave and, and that slave would be able to be free. We need to understand that, that Paul is really saying that we have been enslaved to sin and we've been redeemed. Our freedom has been purchased By the blood of Jesus Christ. Notice chapter 3 verse 10 of Galatians. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Because it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. We're all trying to live a good life, a right life. And and, and, and if we just do enough, he says we're cursed. The law shows us we can't do enough. Now it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. But the law is not based on faith. Instead, the one who does these things will live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, because it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Good Friday, we studied that more uh, intently. But we find that Christ purchased our freedom from sin 
By becoming a curse for us on the cross, he paid our debt. But notice also, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Adopting an individual is very common in this period of history. When we just look at this slice of the big quest, that was very common. The most famous was an adoption that took place by Julius Caesar, who adopted Gaius Octavius, who would be known as Caesar Augustus. And Paul is saying, in the context of that event, there's a greater adoption. Your adoption as a child of God. Your adoption. He's taken you as you are, a sinner. And I want you to be in my family. I will forgive you. I will love you. I will make you clean, pure, Steve said. Through Christ, we've been adopted as Christ's children. So the quest has a purpose. To deliver us from the bondage and penalty of sin and being free now to be adopted as God's child. Now, why is this important? Well, Jesus Christ has divided history into two parts. Everything that happened before him and everything that's happened since him. That's why we have the dates, B.C., A.D., it's a, all of history is divided by Jesus Christ. He divides human race into two parts. Those who are in his kingdom, those who are not in his kingdom. Jesus divides our interest, our thoughts, our, our work into two parts. Those who are advancing the kingdom of God and those who are not. I'm not saying... You have to be a paid minister. Whatever you're doing in life, are you advancing the kingdom of God or not? Jesus puts us in one of two camps. It's about Jesus. It's, it's the difference that he makes. He's, he's the foundation. He's the focal point. Last night, I had the privilege of uh, doing the invocation at the Teen Challenge Banquet. It was at the Show Me Center, and uh, I, I walked into the room, and, you know, they divide the big room into different ways, and I thought, well, there'll be a few hundred people there. I've never been to a Teen Challenge Banquet. There were over 1,100 people there at the banquet. There are 244 Teen Challenge Centers in America. There are more than that, not 244, but there are more in 108 nations around the world. And I had, I had no idea it was that big. But the guy who's over all of it, globally, was there to speak. And he said this, he said, this is the largest banquet he will do of, uh, is the, of all the banquets that are held, he said. Of all the banquets, this is the largest banquet that's held in the world. Right here in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. They had 167 men. Five years ago, they had 90. They got all their beds full. He laid out a five-year plan. They've got to build more facilities. And I tell you, though, the thing that moved me the most, I sat at the table of a guy, TJ, who was going to give his testimony, which he did. And a guy right next to me, every table had a student. This is a current student. TJ was an alumnus. And uh, this guy next to me from Mississippi, big old football player, 19 years of age. You remember Steve sharing a few weeks ago about his son, Ben? Here's a 19-year-old guy who had a full ride to Ole Miss as a left tackle. tackle. He said, I threw it all away. A third testimony. Everyone said the exact same thing. My life was radically changed when I encountered Jesus Christ. I tried a lot of other things to fill the void in my life. There were a lot of other options for help. But they all said it wasn't until I discovered on my quest... Jesus. He's made the difference. 
And so that's why we're going on this quest. There are those here who know the Lord. You, 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 you know who Christ is. But I want to ask you, are you experiencing the fullness of Christ in your life? Can you honestly say that Christ is, is making an impact in my life right now? I see him at work. Maybe you would say, I've lost that first love. I'm just not as passionate about Jesus. I, I don't disrespect him, but there's not that fellowship, that intimacy. It's not how much you know. It's how much of who you know. Do you know him? Then there are those who, who are here today, and you'd say, you know, I've never given my heart to Christ. I've come to a point. Some of you, It's going to take you a while to figure it out. But there are some here today who would say, Pastor, God's been working in my life, and, and I've come to understand I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior, Jesus Christ. I, I, need, I need hope. I need help. I, I want to know this one true God. If there's truth, I want to know it. And you can know it today by giving your heart to Christ. God may be leading some of you to become part of our church family. For others, it may be just to come and pray to talk with someone. Let's bow our heads for just a moment as we pray. Father, I thank you for this time that we've shared together. And I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing and what you're going to do. As we begin the quest, as we begin to learn about Jesus Christ, God, we thank you that he has come to us to help us understand who you are, who we are, and about your kingdom and living that kingdom life here on earth. So, Father, I pray that you'll speak to these who are here this morning. I pray that in this time of response that we'll follow you, our guide, as you lead us now. In Jesus' name, amen.